Welcome everyone to this session in the afternoon uh, titled Creative Cities, Unlocking the Potential of Prod Producers and Co-Creation. Um, this session is going to talk about creativity in cities, uh, which has, like both concepts, have always been very linked to each other. Uh, creativity has always been uh, like a concept and, and a phenomenon very linked to cities and urban life. But somehow in the last 10 years, uh, it has become even more visible and actually a, a key factor for the development of many cities. We have terminologies such as creative cities or uh, the creative class uh, from the author Richard Florida that have uh, become very popular in the last years. And more and more uh, city councils around the world are using creativity to do like development in their own cities. Uh, creativity has taken different forms uh, from art and multiculturality or music, food, design. We see them, all of these phenomena in all of our, our cities. Um, it has influenced new technologies and how new technologies uh, are affecting our, our urban environment as well. Um, it has brought also new processes and methodologies like produced or co-creation. And, and all sorts of benefits, but somehow creativity is also bringing new challenges such as gentrification and it's hiring up the price of housing and other, other challenges that need to be faced as well. Today we have uh, five presentations from very different uh, perspectives that are going to look into these uh, complex, complex aspects. We have our five speakers um, Mr. George uh, Gillespie, he's Assistant Director in land, uh, of Land and Environmental Services at Glasgow City Council. Um, Mr. Daniele Garcia, he's Head of Social Dynamics at Nokia Bell Labs. Then uh, Dr. Shane Shapiro, he's CEO of uh, Sound Diplomacy. Professor Eckert Hesch, uh, he is CEO of Johannes Foundation in Berlin. And finally, Mr. Peter Born Larsen, he is director of City Data Exchange at Hitachi Insight Group. So we can start, Mr. George, please. Okay, good afternoon. Um, as Christina said, I'm George Gillespie, I'm the assistant director. Uh, with Glasgow City Council, Glasgow being in Scotland, which is still part of the, the UK. Um, Scotland been famous for uh, lots of things, uh, including whisky, uh, the home of golf, and the birthplace of Mary Ann MacLeod. Now, some of you might be asking, who is Mary Ann MacLeod? And I don't know if there's any Americans in the room, but Mary Ann MacLeod is the mother of President-elect Trump believe it or not. So uh, Donald Trump claims to be uh, Scottish or certainly Scottish roots. So uh, I make no apologies for that. Um, moving on quickly. I'm just going to talk about um, the Scottish Cities Alliance and what we're doing in Glasgow. So the Cities Alliance is effectively taking the, the seven cities in Scotland, um, bringing those under the, the, the guidance of the Scottish Government and trying to look at how we can improve things through the use of uh, smart technology there. And you see it's very much not just centric around uh, the cities, but very much to do with uh, the regions within Scotland. How are we doing this? Well, we are, cities are talking uh, between each other, uh, even between Glasgow and Edinburgh. There's a rivalry there that um, we've managed to break that down. And the seven cities uh, within Scotland are now talking and sharing um, information, skills and knowledge between us. We're looking at four areas uh, which we've concentrated on, low carbon, hydrogen, the Smart Cities programme and infrastructure and we've made those priorities and there's a strategy to support uh, those particular uh, areas of business. Uh, the journey for us in terms of Glasgow, uh, Glasgow was the, the pilot project uh, within the UK for what's known as Future Cities. It was a £24 million uh, project that allowed Glasgow to look at various demonstrators and effectively for Glasgow to be uh, an exemplar uh, and pilot some uh, innovative projects uh, that will support smart cities going forward. 
Along with that, the Scottish Cities Alliance is looking at the Scotland's eighth city, we call it, and that's the smart city. And that's looking at uh, additional projects that we can implement. We've got funding through the ERDF funding of about £10 million, and we're topping that up uh, to make it another fund uh, worth about £24 million. And in the back end of that, we've got Smart City Scotland, which is a brand which we've now used for uh, the projects that we have within Scotland. So, Future City Glasgow, um, four themes we concentrated on, energy, health, uh, public safety and transport. And from that, there was three work streams that we looked at, which was the City Operations Centre, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, the Open Glasgow, which is effectively a city data uh, platform, which we're all using, and various demonstrator projects. And included within that are active travel, energy efficiency, social transport and intelligent street lighting, which I'm sure most of you are now aware of. But if I can give you an example of active travel, I myself am a civil engineer, a roads engineer. Uh, we tend to think in very much as an engineer does in straight lines. And when we go about uh, our business in terms of looking at implementing cycling measures within the city, we as engineers think about what we think are the most appropriate routes, whereas cyclists tend to go all various routes. So what we're trying to do is pick up that information, use that information to better understand how citizens actually use the city. Um, at the top there, you'll see a, a picture inside of our, and that's so a small part of it, the City Operations Centre. Uh, again, that's bringing various partner organisations within the city who manage and maintain the, the service and enforce uh, the regulations within the city, for example, the police, Community Safety Glasgow and the City Council, and bringing those uh, partner organisations together within one control centre that they can actually share information and gain uh, knowledge and, and experience from that. I mentioned the Smart City programme uh, very quickly. It's a, it's a programme worth about £24 million. And again, it's trying to make better use of data and digital technology uh, within the city. Example of two projects within that was a data cluster, looking at data information and intelligent street lighting. From the Smart City Scotland uh, blueprint that I spoke about earlier on, effectively that uh, is a document that's been produced and that effectively sets out the goals and ambitions of the cities within uh, Scotland about how we move uh, smart cities uh, forward. And effectively within that, it sets out what are the goals and objectives of the various cities as well as the Scottish Government. And you'll see along the right hand side there is a list of the various Pathfinder programmes which we refer to. Um, and you'll see within that um, sharing, learning platform, smart and healthy living, etc. Um, and the circular economy. Circular com economy is, is a big thing within Glasgow. We've got support from Zero Waste Scotland uh, on that front. And what we're trying to do is make better use of the inputs and outputs from each of the cities and very much uh, concentrate our efforts on the food uh, and drink sector. Just to very quickly just give you an overview, and this is a very busy slide, so apologies for that. But this, just, this really just gives you a, an idea of the activity that's going on within Scotland. So um, there's lots of things going on, especially with respect to uh, smart cities. Um, and each of the cities in themselves are doing their own individual projects, but what we are doing is coming together to share, again, that knowledge uh, and experience. And within Glasgow itself, we are doing a, a major project uh, referred to as the City Deal. And that's effectively looking not only at Glasgow City, but in terms of the wider region, over a billion pounds worth of investment. And from that investment, what we're doing is looking at various initiatives that again will promote uh, not only smart cities, but promote inward investment. And that's effectively what we're trying to do uh, as part of the, the City uh, Deal. I don't want to take up too much time today, we've got lots of good speakers. Um, for us, very much the whole part of our programme within, is, within Glasgow and within the Scottish City Alliance is very much to promote that safe, smart and sustainable cities. Uh, and I very much look forward to hearing from the other speakers today uh, on what we're doing uh, elsewhere around the globe. Thank you.
So, um, welcome. <laughs> so, um, we are in the Smart City Expo, right? So we know what uh, Smart City is. Uh, do you? So the typical, um, I work for a company, so the typical uh, company rhetoric around smart cities is uh, always uh, around efficiency and security. Typical line is, uh, I go to work uh, in a smart city and I'm always uh, going to be on time. When I go shopping in a smart city, there is no queue. And in a smart city, I really feel safe uh, because of the CCTV cameras around me. So that's a smart city for uh, typical companies. And uh, well, we know that those things are really important, right? But um, those things actually make a city acceptable, but they don't make it great. There are other things that uh, make a city great. And, um, and they're a bit uh, underdeveloped in the industry. So that's why there are people crazy like me, scientists, uh, who do things that other people don't want to do. So we... To celebrate the things that make city great instead of uh, acceptable, uh, we founded a new um, collaborative network. Let's put it that way. It's called goodcitylife.org. If you go there, you can subscribe to a newsletter, but you also you can see the different projects and you can click on beautiful maps of projects that we'll tell you about now. All right, so basically what we do, we do research. We are scientists. Uh, we work at uh, Nokia Bell Labs in Cambridge, uh, UK. is an industrial lab, but we do research that is really uh, uh, strange uh, because we actually copy people that, um, they, well, yes, they're mostly dead, I would say. Um, so <laughs> those people basically contributed during the 70s, uh, and they're really famous people like Jane Jacobs, Stanley Milgram, Kevin Lynch. How many people know who Jane Jacobs is? Um, Please raise your hand. Thank you very much. Sally Milgram, uh, thank you very much. OK, so those are basically foundational people who do fantastic work, and we just copy it. The only difference between the 70s and nowadays is that we have the web. So we exploited the web to actually repeat their experiments. As simple as that. I'll give you two examples. One, design for urban beauty. Ha, huh, how do you do that? Well. Do you know how Facebook started? How many people have uh, watched the social networking movie? All oh, right, we need to go to the cinema more often. So the social networking movie was about Facebook and uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, basically started with FaceMash. So unfortunately, he was trying to compare uh, the hottest, the top 10 hottest on campus at Harvard. So he built a website where you would say left or right, left or right, and you get a top 10 hottest on campus uh, for that week, I suppose. Um, so we use the same approach, not for girls, but for cities. So face match for cities, where we would ask people, which one is more beautiful? Which one uh, looks quieter? Which one makes you happier in terms of uh, Google Street? views. And we built a website that is called urbangems.org for London that basically says which one, uh, which place we find more beautiful between left and right. You get 10 uh, pairs of pictures. And then if thousands of people uh, play the game, it's a very simple game, one minute game with a purpose. And our purpose is that to rank picture by beauty, by quietness, by happiness. So the really simple thing is that uh, Subjective concepts like beauty, quiet, and happiness, now they can be quantified because you know which pictures come on top and which are the bottom. Of course, these pictures are Google Street Views, they are, they are points on a map. So what do geeks do with points on a map? I'm a failed comedian. Uh, so they actually connect the points. So we built a new mapping tools that instead of giving you the shortest path between A to B, walking path, is going to give you the short path that is more that is happiest, beautiful, and quiet, automatically. So instead of walking 20 minutes, you walk 22 minutes, and you have a totally different experience. There you go. So this is about visual beauty. But I told you, well, there are many other senses, right, apart from, from your eyes, one of which is your smell, your ears, what do you hear what you remember inside your head. So those things are important. And I'm given the time, I'm going to talk just about smell. So smells is really important. 
Your nose is a big data machine. Look at it. Um, economic crisis, one order of magnitude higher. That's your nose. You can, in theory, you can smell more than one trillion different kind of odors. And um, the funny thing is that if you imagine this gigantic pie of one trillion different kind of odors, and you think about city planning, city planning deals with 10 up to 50 of these odors. So in this gigantic pie, you would have a line, and then the rest is totally neglected by city planning. We don't plan for odors at all. We just remove bad odors. Why is that? Well, because odors are really difficult to measure. So we wanted to measure it, and uh, we went, uh, we work with Kate. Kate does her PhD at the Royal College of Art, and she does smell walks around the world. In three years, she went around the world, and she asked people to smell things and uh, report what they smell. There you go. So she reported like 280 words related to urban smell. We match those words with picture tags. If you use Instagram, you have your pictures and you have your keywords that you attach with it. You take a picture of a violet and you tag it with the word violet. We take those words and we match with the tags that Kate gave us in terms of urban smells. And then you can see that uh, if you connect these tags together, all the nature words are together, all the animals words are together, all the traffic emission words are together. The result of it is uh, the first urban smell dictionary that you have, uh, where you have the different uh, smells, nature, food, waste, emission, synthetic, tobacco, and you have the category and subcategories of smell. So for the first time, you can not only celebrate, uh, you can only look at the negative side of smell, like traffic emission, but you can celebrate uh, the positive sides of smell as well. There you go. Some people are thinking, oh, you're using uh, Instagram. Are you crazy? A bunch of uh, hipsters going around? Well, we work uh, with uh, official air quality indicators, and we actually see that uh, the two data sets match. So what you, when you find traffic emission words, there, are, there is a lot of nitrogen dioxide in those parts of the city. When uh, you have uh, nature-related words, you have really low concentration of nitrogen dioxide, which is uh, good for you. All right, just a video to conclude in the last 44 seconds. Uh, this is, uh, we are looking for traffic emission words, for example, in London. And you can see that um, you can, the entire map of the traffic emission in London, don't go there. Instead, uh, go where you find nature-related words. You can map them in, on the entire map of London, and that's the naturescape of London. And you can do that with all the categories that you saw in the wheel, in the smell wheel, right? So that's food if you're hungry, um, and that's the foodscape of the city. So we call this project Smelly Maps, and uh, we have other projects that, uh, so if you go on goodcitylife.org, you can find them, you can look on a map, you can click on it, you can see the smell profile of the street, but also the sound profile of the street, and the emotional profile of those streets for 11 cities around the world. Thank you very much. How can I follow that? <sighs> ah. I'm just going to shout. OK, so first off, let's have some audience participation. Um, I'm going to, first off, close your eyes, everybody, and imagine that music didn't exist. Imagine a world without music. Think about it. Okay, now you can open your eyes. Now, how many people, how many people here have ever heard of a music policy? A couple. Okay, so what I'm here to do is explain a little bit about us and explain a little bit about music and nighttime economy policies. So my name is Shane, and we work with cities and governments around the world to analyze music and nighttime economy, almost in the same way that smell, uh, probably in a worse way, but in, in the same way that smell uh, was just analyzed. And what we're seeing when we're talking about smart cities, when we're talking about livable cities, what I think about is the city you want to be in. And the cities that you want to be in are often the cities that have the most stuff to do. And all that stuff to do tends to happen, a lot of it, at night. And what we do is we have developed a, a city planning system that plans during the day and licenses at night. 
So that means we have a proactive planning system during the day and a reactive system at night. When you react to things, it's expensive and it's not cost effective. We work in 20 countries around the world doing this. And one of the things that we've been working on is developing um, with a number of people a program and a job called the Night Czar in London, if anyone has seen. So the Night Czar or Nightmare, I think there's uh, someone from Amsterdam here, that is a policy initiative that creates a pathway for parliamentarians in cities to talk about nighttime economy. Uh, and we do this as well with music. And we work all over the world. So I'm just going to quickly go through this and I'm just going to talk to you. So we've, through this, we've developed this term called music cities. Now, what is a music city? A music city is a city that thinks about music in the same way that it thinks about anything else. So in order to have a strong music ecosystem, you have to understand what a music ecosystem is. And you have to recognize that every city that, has a val that values its music values its citizens. And for musicians and music industry and culture to proliferate, to, be, to benefit from a quality livable city, we're thinking about sustainability, development, affordable housing, access to transport, and music becomes an anchor, music becomes a node in which you can analyze a number of other aspects in a city. And these are some of the cities that we've been talking to that we've worked in that have looked at this. And what we've done is establish and develop what a music ecosystem is. So think about a music venue. So how, you know, when you think about a music venue and you're my age, you tend to think about sticky floors and crappy toilets, right? Like, that's what you tend to think about. That's what the word is. And unfortunately, that is not what a music venue is. A music venue is an innovation hub for an entire cultural sector. For a music venue to, to succeed in a town, it needs to be serviced by logistics and transport. It, it pays staff. It has staging, lighting, hospitality, and all of that. And in addition, when you have 20 artists performing in a venue, for example, per week, that's 20 micro-businesses whose intellectual property is being beta-tested. And in the UK, Adele is worth a billion pounds to the UK just one artist. And that all started in a grassroots music venue. And a music venue is one of the hearts of a music ecosystem. So what we've done is working to develop new music venues in London. Uh, we've also helped develop an arts and music-based center here. We've created a music conference that links property developers and the music industry together because they tend not to talk to each other as much as they should. And we are writing a music vision in London to understand how music can add value to London's greater economy and how music factors in to quality of life, how music factors into economic development. And our, and our Music Cities um, concept turned into a conference which 160 cities have come to. Not all of them know what, a mu what they're doing with music policy yet, but what we say is well, if you want to benefit your citizens, if you want to benefit your tax-paying residents, you have to know what you have, right? And if you don't map your music ecosystem, you don't understand the value that your music ecosystem has to your city. And in addition to that, your music ecosystem leads... I have three minutes. Now, I was supposed to do less than eight, so I'm going to finish up. Um, in addition to that, a healthy nighttime economy obviously drives tourism, improves city branding, and provides opportunities to, for larger companies to invest. Austin, Texas is the fastest growing city in the United States. And people didn't just go there for the heat. They went there and they invested there because of their music and entertainment and nighttime economy. And the fastest growing cities in the world, uh, Melbourne, for example, uh, are ones with vibrant music and entertainment ecologies. So what we do is we have a tool that measures the value of music in a particular place and measures the value of music, uh, of sorry, of nighttime economy in a particular place by mapping and assessing a city, town, region, even a building's music ecosystem. And then we devise and create a policy where government, the private sector, regulators can talk to each other and be pragmatic about how to safely, responsibly, and, um, and mutually beneficially develop your music and entertainment ecosystem for a city. So that's, that's it. 
Um, this is my first time at Smart Cities Expo. When we go up to people and say we write music strategies, they always say, what is that? So I, I hope that from my side, in five or 10 years time, every city in the world is gonna have a music policy and music strategy. So if you have any more information or you'd like to, some information, uh, I'm a nice person, just say hello. Okay, thank you very much for your time and for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, what a what a great mix. This is really creative. Um, I'm going to hurry up as well. You started that too early, but I'm, okay, I'll do my very best to be short and sweet. Um, everyone was a little short, and so now I've got half an hour, right? Um, <laughs> well, unfortunately not. So I'm going to pull you in a very different direction. I'm looking um, at uh, citizens, what they actually want. Uh, why connecting um, technical and social issues and then also give you some examples of, of integrated planning processes with regard to city development. Um, so let me just pull you into, into some years back. Uh, you know, the Pantheon in Rome uh, was built uh, in four years with uh, two parties involved, despite of uh, the owner, of course. Um, the city where I'm from, the Reichstag Kupola in Berlin, was built in the same time um, uh, and had uh, well, 32 parties involved. Um, so that's that's a bit of a, a different thing. So we, uh, what we now envisage um, is <clears throat> we have a high number of specializations and stakeholders, and it seems to me that we're exactly on that on that um, edge where we um, work together with so many specialized people that now we need a different layer of, of people that know a little bit of everything and trying to connect the dots. Um, also, we see um, a great uh, demand and we have uh, many regulation standards and all the rest of it. Um, uh, Giuliani, the former mayor of New York, uh, recently said uh, just get rid of 50% of all the regulations and see what happens. If uh, there's really a desperate need of a regulation, then just simply put it back into the basket. Not quite sure whether this is correct, but um, so the result is, of course, you know, the, um, the silo areas need to be um, uh, breached. Um, the complexity is rising. And of course, also the costs are rising. Um, we can see it in various uh, projects that we have in Berlin, uh, let alone the, the airport. So let's just assume that we can um, that we can build an energy plus house, which is which is possible. Uh, examples already exist, like this one in Berlin. Uh, you really need to have an integrated planning processes in order to do that. So architects need to talk to energy consultants, uh, structural engineering, HVAC system, and all the rest of it. Uh, when it comes to other issues um, like uh, new services or new products, uh, the user impact and demographic change, um, all these impact highly um, on just this one particular uh, building. So if you would um, develop this building, I'm now just talking about this one particular building, for instance, the user impact on energy consumption and production um, you know, uh, needs to be in line with the energy concept that you are creating. Unfortunately, you don't know what the end user is going to do and how he's going to live. Is he going to really make use of the photovoltaic? Is he rather into some biomass or whatever and wants to change, uh, want to use that? That's completely up to him. But um, also new services like um, selling energy can highly influence the um, setup of the energy uh, concept of this one house. So important to mention that all impact factors um, that I just mentioned are not coming from the building industry. Um, so there is a huge variety of, of different um, technologies, methods, and interests that come together when planning an urban district. Um, as you can see from this image here. And uh, as you can see, building is up here um, and how it is influenced by all the others. So approximately 14 sectors have an impact um, on buildings. So important is to mention we need to combine technical and social um, aspects. That's absolutely crucial. And an integrated moderated process um, is, uh, is very much needed um, that all agreed upon. And that brings me to participation because um, otherwise you can't really um, uh, have the agreement of everyone. So participation, what cities actually want, there are some benefits but also constraints. I'm sure you know that the benefits are strengthening the legitimation and the acceptance for the planning, which is very important, of course. 
and also bringing a lot of creativity, what we are talking about here as well. But also the liability is very, very worth to mention because uh, only by mentioning certain things and ideas doesn't make you liable um, for certain things. So, and there's also the issue of unequal engagement. Some are really engaged and how do you really uh, get a grasp of what everyone thinks or what the mainstream uh, basically thinks. In addition to all that, um, when a project starts, it's already probably already too late for people to get into uh, the heart of the matter and uh, participate. So what we have done as a foundation, we have uh, made use of a festival that was uh, uh, that happened in Berlin, um, actually with great music. Um, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> and we asked 280 young people in, in the age of 90 to 29 what they actually think a district and a city needs. Unfortunately, the artist uh, was writing everything in German, so I hope you can make sense of it. Um, and most important issues, as you can see, affordable housing was 70%, parks and greenery was 70%, and public transport 63%. That's interesting, um, and not really important for them is car parking and traffic congestion. Well, I must say, co traffic congestion in, German, in, in Berlin looks very different from other really big cities. In addition to all that, we were looking at how important in your living environment is affordable housing. You've seen that, 70%. Security is also very important. Uh, bicycle friendliness, as you can see. And if you bring in very important that important, that's also good neighborhood and not so much uh, shops and cafes is also good, but you know. And then how important for your home is uh, long-term living safety. And when you look at this as a you know, very important plus important issue, it's uh, roughly around 90%. So that's extremely important for the people, um, especially for the young people that uh, have a really groomy vision on how they can actually live um, and how they can afford uh, living in a, in a uh, safe environment. Um, and then uh, balcony and garden level, low level of rent and all the rest of it is um, also very important for them. I only got a little bit uh, limited uh, time, so I'll just speed through. The other issue that might be interesting for you, how do you use your smartphones with regards to technic as a technical device? Um, many of the young people said, uh, yes, of course I'm going to use it. Just have a look at the overall uh, percentage. It's very high, as you can see. Um, so they are happily using it for energy saving, uh, for you know, combined different transport modes and all the rest of it. So that's um, also um, quite important to see that the young generation is also, of course, picking it up. Some of the images, just to show you, <clears throat> so that's about my city. Um, they all want to be happy, of course, and have different cultures. Um, and this is about the district in itself, so they want to have greenery, sharing, um, public transport, <clears throat> and it actually reflects very well uh, what we have been seeing. And then, last but not least, um, two quick examples. Uh, uh, Park City South is a very interesting development uh, where the city of Cologne actually put together really a big planning team. Uh, they were working together very closely on a step-by-step -step development to collect ideas. They were nearly over challenged with the 70 ideas they've got uh, from, from the people. They didn't know what to do with them, so they really were challenged. Um, and they had very professional support throughout the entire process. So as you can see here, um, running out of time here, so there's a whole stack of activities that line up and where uh, the planning team is picking up um, the results um, to really uh, bring it into the um, district development. The other example is coming from Berlin, the Holzmark district, close to the uh, Spree River. Uh, people said uh, the river close, uh, the area close by uh, to the river is very important, so we'll leave that to the public area and then uh, build some other things around it. Also integrating uh, people um, in a very interesting way, um, early involvement uh, with all necessary experts, so a really um, a structured process that's very important. So ending up uh, with my um, key three messages, multitude of technical and social aspects require a moderated, concerted, integrated process for district development. So that's really important. So you can't live with just having uh, people tell you, oh, this is what I like, uh, and end of story. So you really need to have a good process to, to uh, cater for that. Uh, the user needs and wishes are fairly unknown. Our experience shows that the desire for affordability, you've seen it, uh, is extremely big and it contradicts the current development with having additional technology and additional technology making it more and more expensive. Last but not least, 
projects implementing citizens' need show a much better quality through the process of uh, creating um, you know, the local knowledge and integrating it um, into the thing. Whether it's going to look like this or like this or like this, I don't know, but we're definitely going to create it together. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, what Hitachi has done in, in Copenhagen, and I'm going to talk about a data marketplace, but I'm not going to go in and talk about all the technical details, so you can stay in here. Uh, this is very much about co-creation, uh, and I think we just had some great examples of how important data is, uh, but also what kind of data is actually out there. I didn't actually think about smells, how important that could be, but you can actually see how important that is to city planning. Um, so the city of Copenhagen uh, back in 2013 and 14 started to say, well, we have an open data portal and we have our own data that is creating a little bit of insight to what kind of decisions oh, and how the city works. Um, but if you look at one example, parking is a bit of a boring example, but they don't own all the parking data, all the parking, uh, parking places. So if you have to make a parking solution, you also need the private sector parking data in order to make a, a good solution here. So the city of Copenhagen, they said, well, um, we want the private sector data as well as the public sector data. They still have their open data portal, um, but they said in order actually to get much better insight of what, what, how things are happening in the city, and the city of Copenhagen has some extremely ambitious targets. Uh, one is to be CO2 neutral in 2025. Um, they're at the same time, why being CO2 neutral, they also want to create growth. And most importantly, actually, the word was mentioned already, they want to be a livable city. Um, and that's a key. And I think some of the data and some of the initiative we already heard of is a really important part of this. So they created a competition uh, to have a marketplace where you can buy and sell data. Uh, and they wanted to have this insight themselves. But I said, it's the, it's the companies and it's the universities that is um, making the solutions uh, for the city, so they also need to get a better insight uh, to what's happening in the city. So what we have done in terms of the co-creation, we signed a contract with the city of Copenhagen back in April 2015. Um, and you've probably seen a lot of these open data portals and also private data portals. There's a lot of data there. But we started to talk to the companies and the universities, and they said, so how often do we actually use these data portals? I said, well, we use them sometimes, but it's not actually the data we want or we need in order to make some better decisions and get some better insight to make some more livable and better solutions for the city. So in 14 months, we've been speaking to more than 600 companies to try and find out what do you actually need? If you need to make these green solutions, technical solutions, and all of these better solutions for the city, what information do you need? Then they start to talk about, I need transport data, I need infrastructure data, event data, smell data maybe even, uh, music data, where are the music venues and so on. All of these things are actually extremely important. But then we started to talk about this data, what kind of format do you need it in? Do you need real-time data? Do you need historical data? All of these kind of things to try and understand the data consumers. What is it that you actually want? And a lot of the companies said, that's a simple thing. If we base a product or a service on data, we need to know it's here for the next few years because it's like fuel to a car. If you can't get any fuel, you, don't have, you can't drive anywhere. And it's the same with data. If you base your product or service on the data, you can't get it. The product or the service dies. So that's something where we have, we need subscriptions to data so you can actually subscribe to a data set for a certain period of time. So it's trying to actually understand the users of a data portal, what do they want? That we take over to the data suppliers, which often are the same kind of, uh, the same companies or universities or, and even citizens, to try and tell them that what kind of data do you actually have? Uh, this is what people want, you can actually supply that. So to get companies to, uh, to put data on the, on the platform, um, what, is that easy to get companies to sell their data? Uh, I think the answer is, I know the answer is no. 
This is a, a figure from uh, the Danish Ministry uh, of, of Business and Growth. So they did a report called Big Data as a, as a Growth Factor in Denmark. And they asked a lot of companies that did a survey. And I said, so how do you feel about working with big data? How confident are you with that? And they pointed out some barriers. So one is competences. Uh, there's a lot of companies who don't have data scientists. They don't have data analysts even. That's all the thing about privacy. Uh, do we own the data? Do we not own the data? If we own the data, what can we actually do with it? Economical constraint is actually linked to the fact that data Selling data, buying data is not an integral part of the business strategies. So even though we think this is interesting, it's nice, but we're not going to allocate a lot of resources to do it because we don't really understand it in the right way. And data availability, yes, there's a lot of data out there, but not actually in the way that the companies want this. So when we, another thing we asked the companies when we asked them what kind of data they want, I said, I want something about bus stops, I want weather data, I want some underground data. And we said to them, you can already find that. That's the open data portal that has all the free data. But I said, yeah, that's right, but it's really fragmented. Uh, and I don't really know where I can find this data. Um, and it comes in different formats and so on. So we actually looked into how much data, how many data portals in Copenhagen is there uh, that contains information, or in Denmark that contains uh, information about Copenhagen, and we found more than 70, 70. So imagine you're a student, or you work in a city, you work in a company, you want some information about a certain topic, where should you look? So one of the things we will do, haven't done yet, but we will do, is to create links uh, to all of these data sets. So you go into the platform, uh, citydataexchange.com, and you go to Open Data Transport, for example, then you get about 15 links, and you click on that link, and you go into the public sector uh, open data portal. So we're not going to host that. What we will host is the private sector data, and there's already been some examples of what private sector data could be. Um, so everything is anonymized, but it's really important to understand how the citizens behave in order to make decisions. So that could be telecom data, it could be transaction data, it could be data from different types of apps and the choices we make, Instagram and so on, to try and understand that. So why would companies put their data on the, on the platform? Uh, and there's two reasons for that. One is to monetize it. Uh, they all think it's an asset. Data is an asset, so you can actually earn money on it. But actually more the companies thought it's more important that we know who is using our data. And why is that so important? Uh, actually, back to the previous slide, but we don't really understand what we can use our data for. Um, and there's a lot of intelligent people using data for really interesting apps, but also other kind of services. And so that's one of the things we've done with this co-creation to try and understand what the companies want. So we're doing user reports. So if you sell your data set, then you actually get, uh, find out who is buying it. And a lot of the open data portals don't do that. So you can actually find out who they are. So we speak to banks, insurance companies, all kinds, uh, supermarket to say we would love to find out who's buying it uh, but we actually don't know who could do in interesting things with the, with the data so we have a lot of workshops and at these workshops we normally get companies to say just mention two or three data sets uh, and then we get people to raise their hand and saying what what kind of do you want to buy this data and they raise their hand and normally you can guess half of them yeah that's the retail industry they always want this but then you get two or three companies raising their hands of students who they've never talked to before. And then they ask the question, what do you need my data for? And this is when you start to talk about innovation and you actually get these companies or students who have never met each other before. And there's one denominator is data. And they can actually start to think about how can we use this data in new intelligent ways? See the time is running. Um, I'm gonna skip that. So this is what it looks like. Um, so basically, we are a broker. We have a data portal. This is what it looks like. Uh, but we actually built the ecosystem around it to try and understand supply and demand. So you can go into the data portal. You can look at samples of data. You don't have to register or do anything. Uh, but for a lot of different sources, both from the public sector and the private sector. Uh, you can subscribe to data. Uh, you can buy data, subscribe to data, do one-time downloads. And you can also publish your data in here. And one last thing, because I see time is running. Um, again, co-creating with the users, they said, well, if you do a project in a certain part of the city, it would be great to be able to zoom in on a map 
and click on the different categories where you see the map there and actually find out what kind of information can I find in this area of the city uh, and just click whatever you want of that kind of data. And if you can't find it, then we have people working here. You can actually ask us uh, in the information you want. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, the five of you, for sharing your projects and experiences. We have some time for uh, questions from the audience. I remind you that you have the option on the app of the event of Ask and Vote, and you can make your questions there. I welcome you to go to the mic as well, th those who are not very shy. So I don't know if there is any questions from the audience. Yes? Hi there, um, my name's Pete, I work for a company called TGAC. Um, we're actually, we're working on the uh, mobility pavilion for the Dubai 2020 World Expo. Um, so there's gonna be, it's all about the kind of the movement of data and people and ideas and how that's changing and potentially opening up different types of social engagement and social mobility. Um, you guys obviously you kind of you collect a lot of data and analyze a lot of data is there a uh, is are there different bits of society people who aren't contributing to to that kind of data and who actually need a very different type of data to improve their lives and make the city more livable for them maybe they don't they're not quite so technical they don't have a smartphone maybe they've got an old cell phone or whatever um, how are kind of your systems taking into account people who aren't in the kind of the high level of tech and data kind of giving and receiving? Says on. Yeah. I, get, I guess the question was for me. <laughs> oh, I can definitely start. Um, you're absolutely right. I talked about the competences of who is actually understanding this, uh, this data. Uh, and one of the reasons why I should say, we don't own the data, so we can't actually do anything with it. Uh, so it's a bit like Airbnb. Uh, they don't own the, the apartments and so on. Um, but we did listen to what a lot of the companies were saying, so we don't actually understand the raw data. Um, so one of the things we are going to build is something called analytical workspace, which basically you can start to combine the data, and then you get it visualized, and then you can actually start to work with it. But the other thing is that the city said, well, there's all of these small uh, innovative companies who are actually data scientists, who start up, so start up companies. And we talked to a lot of these and they said, if we could just get a hold of this data, we can transfer that in so everyone could, could actually understand it. So that's their speciality. The problem they had so far is either the data is really hard to get or it's too expensive. Uh, so if they can go to one place and actually start to find different data sources, uh, they can actually start to grow their business. Uh, so it's not Hitachi going in and just taking everything and making chart. We could, we could <laughs> buy it, but, uh, but it's actually to open, open this up to the community and open it up especially to startup companies who can then provide a service for a smaller, larger companies or different types of groups, uh, universities and so on. I would like to just add um, on the district level uh, because we as a foundation are accompanying projects um, and basically what you have been asking is about how to integrate the wishes and the needs of the people um, into the planning process. Uh, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and yes, of course, you can use data, uh, but uh, most of the developers uh, know that 80% of the people that are uh, coming to a new development um, are basically coming out of a um, circular out of, I don't know, five kilometers or whatever. So you can actually <coughs> get a feel, first of all, of the neighborhood. You can contact them through, through of course, various uh, ways, neighborhood.com or .de or whatever you want to take. Uh, but in addition to all this, it is extremely important um, to use also the analog way, you know, to get in contact with the people because, as you rightly said, not everyone has access to the data um, or can submit data. Um, so that is very important. I just wanted to remind you that, that uh, there's nothing that really can um, uh, this, this is actually a must because through the discussion with people you can actually get a feel uh, f of what they actually want and it's a process 
because they also at the beginning not know what they're going to know at the end of the process. So I think that's very important to, to guide them also through this way of development. I think we mapped music, all the music venues in London. Um, and the way we did it by the end is we went door to door and knocked on their door. That was the only way that we could get all of them. We, we tried everything, um, I promise, uh, including phone calls and carrier pigeons. But we ended up hiring somebody to walk around. And what it made me realize is when I think of nighttime economy, for example, or even any economy, you always ask for whom. And I try not to ever answer that question because it should be for, the pe for whatever that person who I'm speaking to wants it to be. When we say music, we mean whatever you think music means. And I think that that's something that I had to learn. I tried to answer a question that wasn't answerable. And I think data has its limits. Sometimes you have to go and talk to people. Just one last comment from, from my side. Um, there's this uh, example of uh, Botrom Innovation City, uh, Botrop uh, Innovation City Ruhr, and um, they were also knocking at people's door uh, and 16,000 households and reducing the energy consumption by 50% by just telling them what to do. So this would have never been able to, to do you know, with, with data. Maybe Daniele or George? I think that the most important thing is to make sure that the data is relevant and people can access it properly. I always remember at the beginning of our Smart Cities journey, um, we had a group of consultants, and I'm not blaming any consultants Sorry. in the room, There's but I was asking about the relevance of some of the data that was being captured. So we had all these data sets um, that we were gathering all this information, and that was fantastic. But what was the information? And one of the examples that the consultant gave me was the waiting times for the accident emergency um, departments at the various hospitals within Glasgow. And the example he gave me was if he was in his kitchen and he accidentally cut his hand and he was starting to bleed out, he was able to use his smartphone and work out what was the, the shortest waiting time at the local accident emergency uh, hospitals. Um, the other example which he gave me, and I didn't think that was a particularly good example, and the other example he gave me was the driving test pass rate. So of all the driving test centres in Glasgow, he was able to tell you exactly what was the best one to go to to get the best um, opportunity of getting a pass. So I think what we've got to be doing is, is making sure that the information is relevant and to make sure that that information can be obtained and accessed by people right across the board in terms of stakeholders. Um, it's all well and good gathering all this information, but it's actually making sure it's relevant to what people's needs are um, in order to make it you know, a smart city. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I guess the question was, how do you collect data that is underrepresented in the data, right? So in the data set. Uh, yeah, you just need to talk to people. And in the research world, there are tons of methodologies that are qualitative. So it's like when you go to the psychologist, right? It makes you aware of your problems. And then once you know your problems, uh, then you can inform the qualitative methodologies. And the two things you need to do, they need to be scalable and replicable. Scalable to the entire city. And replicable, you can replicate in end cities around the world. That's uh, what you need. The good thing for Dubai is that if you look at the penetration rates of Instagram, it's far higher than that in London or New York. So good luck with that. <laughs> Um, there is a question on the iPad, and then we can do another one because we still have some time. Um, we like if we can answer like yeah a bit shorter, so more people can ask questions. That would be great. So this one I'm choosing because I feel the local responsibility. Like I don't know if you know the context, but we've been having some issues with tourism in Barcelona in the last years. Like it's increased so much, and the city has become very successful and. We're kind of suffering from it somehow. Um, the question is, how does, uh, sorry, to what extent a public policy on music entertainment can contribute to a more conscious tourism? What is the impact of festivals like Primavera Sound or Sonar? 
that I for me? That's for Shane. And like, if you like, if you want to. Okay, uh, we have an office here in Barcelona. I kind of wish my business partner, who's born and raised here, would answer this question. But I'm going to give it a go. First off, I find that Barcelona has too many festivals and not enough music venues. I don't know if anyone would agree, but when you do an yeah. asset infrastructure of a city, you recognize what you have a lot of and what you have very little of. Also, music can be an amazing tool to get people to different places. So we, uh, and to, I would say, I don't know, I hate the word gentrify, but at least do stuff in places where stuff didn't previously happen. Uh, one of the examples here, so we worked on the strategy of a center called Faber y Coates in San Andreu, I think it is. And uh, we used to be based in Gracia, but we've moved out there to San Andreu. And I think that, I believe that music policy can identify the early adopters, work with planning and licensing authorities to help develop better master plans around new areas. Second to that, if you have high density issues in one place and low density issues in another place, that gets magnified when you have ephemeral experiences. When you have festivals that have a lot of people in one place and then that's it, it's very hard to plan over a long period of time to manage that. So by understanding and working with people, uh, people flow and density models, and then also understanding where there are opportunities to set up new events in new parts of Barcelona, you can hopefully mitigate these issues. You need a policy around it. You need music to play a part of open data of, of all of these things. And you need more music venues. Anybody? OK. Uh, it's just a comment. I was thinking that maybe you two guys can combine the music and the, and the smells. You know, there's um, research a <laughs> long time ago that it's um, like 10, 20 years ago. Um, composition by body movement or by colors and uh, maybe you can you know map smells to feelings and compose music by the smells that you have on these routes and just you know help the, o the only thing people <laughs> like more than music I feel is food <laughs> and that's driven by smell. I'm allergic so I prefer music. You're allergic to food? <laughs> I'm allergic to a lot of food yes oh, so no. it's one of the you know pleasures that I'm so yeah, definitely we're going to invite him over uh, so we can talk uh, in the lab. And, um, and we did actually, I mean, I didn't show all the things we did, but if you go on the website, on my website, there are tons of publications on this stuff. Um, and we did a project on colors and smell, for example. Uh, and colors and sound and sounds and smells. So we are looking at the different layers, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, uh, but we never look at uh, creating, for example, sound of, and that's a super interesting thing to do. Now we are working on sort of robots that he creates stories out of people. So what people do inside their homes, and then they create fictional stories. Um, but it's, uh, it's more an art project than um, in something. Yeah. In a way, but uh, starting from uh, real lives of people. I must admit that I'm allergic to some sorts of music as well. <laughs> Everyone's so it does exist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we can so have the last question. Uh, it was an interesting uh, 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 conference, I think, and I was really interested to ask uh, about the music thing. And again, but you've talked about how you want to create venues for uh, better experience, but I was uh, I was also concerned about how street music is growing, and there are like many cities with really nice music street, but I don't get to know about them. Like I'm in Barcelona for like four or five days. I want to try, like where's the best street music going on, mm -hmm. but I can't get the answer for that. And the second okay. thing is, how do you promote like growing artists so that they have a place to play if they are not a big band to play in a venue? Still, they, there needs to be an infrastructure to support their thing and uh, so, yeah. um, street performance needs to be mapped and regulated like anything else uh, London has arguably the best street performance mapping infrastructure in the world they also have the most formal busking infrastructure in the world even though in London it's criminalized in some places and promoted in other places so it's far from perfect but the concept is there um, I believe that yes street performance needs to be relative to the local community as well uh, so I believe that community organizations, uh, bids, business improvement districts, uh, what we call safer street organizations and, and high street organizations need to be involved. And 
the artist development question to me comes back to recognizing e an ecosystem when it blows my mind when you see all these data points that Copenhagen is measuring in relation to what it all comes down to is quality of life. Mm -hmm. It always comes down to quality of life. I can pay my bills. I can eat where I want to eat. I'm healthy. And I believe that w you, everyone should have a right to pursue a career in music like they should to pursue a career in anything else. And every city should have the infrastructure to support that, even if in our industry, 99% of the people don't make it. But you should still have that infrastructure. And cities that don't have it are, are essentially losing uh, pounds, pence, euros, whatever, every day that they don't have it. Sorry that Very, um, very quickly. Yeah, I um, do you mention all the data points in Copenhagen and so on? Uh, and if any city, I think, want to be a livable city, and is a livable city, I think it's a good example of that. Um, but the way they want to use the data, I think there's three things we talked about. How can you actually ask the citizen? One, you can ask them, invite them to the town hall. You know all the names of these people coming there. You can do surveys. You can go and knock the doors. That's another way to get that information. For, for music and noise and sounds and, and so on, if you gather information from the telcos, they know where people move. And you get that with event data, you get it with all kind of crime data and stuff like that. You actually understand the choices that people are making just looking at data. And that's a good information to get, but you need to combine it with talking to people and the other things as well. So I think a combination of the three things is the way we, we need to do this. Okay, we have to wrap up. I would like to thank th the five of our speakers for being here and the audience uh, this last day. Uh, talking about creativity, I would like to remind you that tomorrow there is organized uh, Jane Jacobs Walk, uh, which Daniele mentioned yesterday. You're all welcome to join. We're going to depart from here, from the venue, and we're going to visit uh, like Hospitale de Llobregat, which is the city where the FIRA is which has like big contrasts in terms of uh, urban planning and like social fabric as well. So thank you very much everybody and hope to see you next year too.